started. Uh, so everyone, uh, if you could unmute, mute, mute yourself. And um, questions can be asked directly by unmuting uh, or in the chat if you can't speak. Um, so it's a great pleasure to have to bring off Dave from Edinburgh slash UC Davis uh, to be determined, I guess, um, here with us this week. And he'll talk about holomorphic twists and vertex algebras. So please, to the Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, thanks a lot for the invitation. And it's really nice to see all of you. Um, so I, I want to talk about um, mainly a paper that came out a few months ago uh, with uh, Kevin Costello and Davide Gaiotto. Um, and Kevin spoke about some aspects of this at, at String Math last week. Um, I will maybe have a slightly slightly different perspective and compliment, um, compliment Kevin's talk um, in, in a few ways, but it's, it's about the same topic. Um, one of our big motivations in studying the subject uh, was to promote um, a bunch of half index dualities um, that I worked on with Davide and Natalie Paquette um, a few years ago uh, to promote these half index dualities to dualities of vertex algebras, um, where the half indices are actually computing the characters of um, the various vertex algebras. Um, and then there's all sorts of uh, there are all sorts of ongoing directions and work in progress um, involving line operators that my student Nick Garner has been working on and, and Kevin and his student Kei Zhang have been working on bulk vertex algebras and gauge theories. Um, well, may, maybe say a bit about that later, but the, the, the story is, is far from finished. Um, so, the setup is a 3D n equals 2 gauge theory. And there are some very general things that I'll say that don't even require gauge theory. Uh, it's any 3D n equals 2 theory with certain symmetry properties, um, though all of the um, eventual constructions and calculations that I'll describe um, involve theories with Lagrangians. Uh, of Schoen Simon's matter th theories. Um, to get vertex algebras out of this, one needs to use uh, a certain twist. And in 3D n equals 2, there's no topological twist available, but there is a partially holomorphic and partially topological twist. And I'll say a bit more about that in a second. Um, just to, to give some background, though, um, the um, Global geometry of this twist was discussed um, also a few years ago by uh, Aganagaj, Costello, McNamara, and Vafa. Um, so, so this sort of twist makes sense on three manifolds that have a transverse holomorphic foliation structure, which just means locally um, they look like a holomorphic direction times a real direction. Um, and then that, that gets globalized. Um, and this was also related to uh, topological strings with quisotropic brains um, in that paper, which I will not discuss at all. Um, upon compactifying this 3D holomorphically twisted theory in various ways, one arrives at more familiar twists. So if and we take the holomorphic direction and put it on a circle, we end up with a two-dimensional B model. Um, if we take the topological direction and put it on a circle, we end up with a half-twisted model in, in two dimensions. And so if you, if you literally put it on a circle, you'll get a two comma two theory in the half-twist, uh, which is related to chiral Duram. Um, in the case of sigma models. Um, and 
if you put it on an interval with zero comma two boundary conditions, you'll end up with this half twist of the zero comma two theory um, related to, to chiral differential operators. Um, so these sorts of holomorphic twists have been widely studied in, in two dimensional zero two and, and two comma two contexts. Um, the other relation to sort of familiar things uh, involves compactifying with, with an angular momentum background where the holomorphic direction is actually is, is fibered non-trivially over S1. Um, and that, that leads to uh, an A twist in, in omega background in two dimensions. And maybe say a bit more about connections with that on, on the next page, but, but that, that's also ongoing work. Uh, the, the main topic that I'll focus on today involves working locally um, and trying to understand local operators in, in this holomorphically twisted theory. And, and for that, I don't need to talk about global geometry at all. It, it suffices to just work in flat space, C times R. So in the first half of the talk, um, I want to describe how the vertex algebras arise in the bulk and the boundary of, of one of these theories on C times R. And in the second half of the talk, I'll start going through the zoo of various examples and sort of interesting new features that, that appear in these, in these vertex algebras. Um, I should um, I should say that there tried to emphasize this before there there just there are many connections to to other topics of recent discussion and interest. Um, these sorts of three D n equals two theories are um, sort of central in the three D three D correspondence and um, in particular the sort of modularity uh, observations. Uh, in recent work by Chengchen, Ferrari, Gukov, and Harrison, um, are uh, have to do with characters of these of these boundary vertex algebras, and the vertex algebras themselves have have shown up in relation to three and four manifolds. Um, though though typically there the theories are much fancier than Lagrangian gauge theories. Um, in the connection with the A model where you compactify with the twist, uh, all of this stuff is related to quantum K theory, that line operators in the holomorphic twist of 3dn equals two. Sort of um, when, when one says like quantum K theory in this um, A model lifted to three dimensions, what one is actually computing or what one should be computing is, is the K theory of the category of line operators in the 3D holomorphic topological twist. And that, that's something that has yet to be spelled out carefully. Um, and then if we start looking at 3D n equals four theories, this, um, well, viewing a 3D n equals four theory as n equals two, uh, the, the holomorphic twist is sort of the, the setup that's relevant for uh, a lot of the work of Agan Agic and Okunkov on, on stable envelopes and elliptic homology recently. Um, and one can also start with the holomorphic twist and deform it to a fully topological one. And then the sort of boundary vertex algebras I'll describe, um, well, first they acquire stress tensors, which, which the ones in this talk usually won't have. Um, and they, some family of them was described by, by Costello and Gaiotto. Okay. So this is, I'm, I'm front loading the, the motivation and future directions. Um, and now I actually want to get into the structure. Okay, so what are we actually doing? Um, in some sort of standard conventions, uh, the 3dn equals two algebra has four generators and a pair of them commute to a holomorphic derivative, a pair of them commute to an anti-holomorphic derivative, and 
and then mixing um, Q pluses and Q minuses in the two pairs, one gets time translations. Um, you, if you want to twist this theory, so twisting in flat space just amounts to identifying a no potent element in, in the SUSY algebra, and, and there's no choice. Uh, up, up to isomorphism, you either choose one of the Q pluses or you choose one of the Q minuses, and, and they all square to zero. So um, I'm going to make a choice. Um, and I don't want to show you everything yet. Um, so I'll make a choice. I'll take Q plus bar as, as the supercharge whose cohomology I'll take. Um, and once I do that, uh, you notice that anti-holomorphic derivatives and sort of, I, I call it the time direction. I mean, um, everything is Euclidean in this talk. Um, this is Euclidean time. By, by T, I just mean the, the sort of the real, the real direction transverse to this complex plane. Um, so translations in that real direction um, and Z bar translations become exact. Um, and there's a convenient way to um, sort of pack that. We, if we consider uh, an exterior derivative in the Z bar and T directions, uh, we can write this exterior derivative as uh, a commutator of our supercharge Q and some Q prime uh, that's formed from two of the other supercharges with formal differentials attached. Um, so that's just, just a formal linear combination. And what I mean by that is, is that I, I can act on local operators with it. And so if I, when I act with this uh, Q prime, uh, I'll just take Q plus of a local operator and then wedge with a DZ bar, Q minus and wedge with a DT. Um, so that, that's this, this Q prime is going to be used for building descendants. Um, okay. Um, and finally, I should say that as far as the algebra is concerned, there are uh, two useful U1 symmetries around. Um, there's an R symmetry that physically it rotates Qs and Q bars in opposite directions. <clears throat> and here I'll, I'll choose the charges so that the differential has R charge one. And then this, this Q prime that, that makes some translations exact uh, has charge minus one. Um, and then there's also, um, so I call it a twisted spin. So, so there's spin, of course, um, but it's more convenient to mix spin with R charge a little bit and define a twisted spin, um, just as one would do in topological twists, such that uh, Q has charge zero. Um, and then it turns out that after wedging with these differentials, Q prime also has charge zero, um, but holomorphic derivatives have, have spin one. Um, and in the vertex algebras, R charge will give rise to a cohomological grading, and this twisted spin will, will give rise to the usual conformal grading. Okay, so, so then what do we get? <clears throat> If we look at, <coughs> excuse me, Q cohomology of bulk local operators, we find that correlation functions of Q closed operators only depend on holomorphically on their insertion points in the C plane. And they don't depend on their position in the transverse real direction at all. Um, and that, that turns the otherwise quite complicated operator algebra um, into, into a vertex algebra. The OPEs in this vertex algebra are, are stupid, um, at, at least um, 
there might be some higher structure involved, but just working in cohomology. Um, the only way that a correlation function can become singular physically is, is when the supports of two operators collide in, in Euclidean quantum field theory. And since translating operators in the real direction is a Q exact operation, um, we can equivalently compute a head on collision OPE by taking one operator and just moving it far away in the real direction. Um, the result is the same up to Q exact terms. Um, and so in defining this algebra's Q cohomology of local operators, um, the, the OPEs will automatically be non-singular. On the other hand, uh, there is something quite interesting that happens. Um, the, the fact that the OPEs are non-singular, um, making this what in, in math is usually called a commutative vertex algebra, um, opens up the possibility of higher structure. And in this case, the higher structure takes the form of a lambda bracket, um, making this into what is usually called a Poisson vertex algebra. Um, so physically, the lambda bracket has a very concrete description in terms of descent. Um, so in, um, in a paper with uh, Bean, Bensky, Bullimore, and Andy Neitsky, um, I, I explained sort of the descent origin of these higher operations in topological field theories. Um, and more recently, Junya Yagi wrote a, a really nice paper um, sort of generalizing this whole construction to holomorphic topological twists. Um, and the, the construction that, that he gave is the following. Uh, to define the lambda bracket of, of two operators, uh, uh, two local operators, O1 and O2, um, one takes the first descendant of O1, which just means act with that Q prime on O1. The thing that, so remember Q prime had DZ bars and DTs attached, so it'll turn O1 into a one form local operator. It's the one form local operator, Q of which, uh, gives you the exterior derivative. Um, now, if this were a topological theory, you would form extended operators by taking descendants and just integrating them on cycles. Um, here, you have to wedge with dz by hand. But once you do, uh, you get something that can be integrated on a surface um, and only depends topologically on the surface modulo Q exact terms. Um, so upshot, um, take the first descendant of one of these operators, wedge with DZ and integrate on a two sphere surrounding the other operator. Um, this entire operation will define a new local operator. It only depends topologically on the surface. And so the surface can just be squeezed down to the location of that second operator. Um, and the whole thing can be deformed by a parameter lambda, um, where this whole lambda bracket thing comes in and, and that's the lambda deformation is useful for understanding what, what the Jacobi identity and anti-symmetry are, are supposed to mean here. Um, I'm not going to talk much about. Um, I, I will just in some simple examples discuss the lambda equals zero case where we don't have this extra to the lambda z. Um, and then that's, uh, that's a bracket of R charge or cohomological degree minus one and, and spin minus one. Okay, so one of the, one of the reasons one might care about this bracket um, is that, um, and, and sure, uh, to answer Jacques' question, uh, you, you could you could throw other things in there. Uh, the, the, e to the, the e to the lambda z is just 
particularly useful for writing down a sensible version of symmetry and, and Jacobi identities, which are sort of difficult to understand otherwise. Um, I'm just going to briefly read out the question because people watching the video later will oh, see that. the yeah. chat. So the question by Jack was, can you replace the lambda z by any arbitrary f of z? Yes, yes. And, the, and the answer is yes. Um, so um, one reason this is this bracket is is important and one should be interested in it physically um, is that um, it gives you a way to produce DZ derivatives, holomorphic derivatives. Um, since this is a an a vertex algebra with non-singular OPEs, it can't possibly have a standard sort of stress tensor, um, which like by standard stress tensor, I mean something that generates derivatives through uh, singular terms in the OPE. That, that can't happen. What happens instead is that there is a sort of a secondary stress tensor. Uh, physically, it's coming from a particular component of the supercurrent um in the in the n equals two theory um and it's it's an element in this vertex algebra that generates derivatives via the bracket um and you can just intuitively understand why why that sort of thing might happen if you take a supercurrent and take its descendants you actually get a component of the stress tensor um and that thing is beautifully or conveniently packaged as a two form that can be integrated over over a sphere and it just rep reproduces the the physical operation of generating a derivative by integrating the stress tensor around a local operator um sorry TV mirror Um, so, right, so upshot summary, bulk algebra is a commutative Poisson vertex algebra um, with a secondary stress tensor. Boundary vertex algebras are um, maybe less fancy. Um, so given a boundary condition that uh, preserves 0 comma 2 supersymmetry, um, in particular, it preserves our differential Q um, and preserves E1R symmetry and rotations. Um, so the boundary conditions I'm talking about are going to be cutting the topological or real direction in half. Um, and the holomorphic plane is parallel to the boundary. Um, then we'll get a boundary vertex algebra essentially the same way. Uh, by taking Q cohomology of boundary local operators. Uh, but now the OPEs can be singular because if operators are stuck onto the boundary, you can't, you can't move them apart. You can't sort of resolve this collision. Um, in general, um, there won't be a boundary stress tensor. And that's sort of related to the fact that these boundary vertex algebras will in general have a large center. And whenever a vertex algebra has a large center, you can't generate derivatives with singular terms in the OPE all the time. Um, so again, physically, why why is there no boundary stress tensor? Well, a boundary stress tensor would be would be an operator T. I call it T partial here, um, such that like integrating this operator in a circle around a boundary a boundary local operator generates a derivative. Um, but but physically, since this is not just a standalone 2D theory, it's coupled to stuff in the bulk, um, derivatives in general are obtained by integrating a bulk stress tensor around a hemisphere and a boundary stress tensor about a circle, and both contributions are, are non-trivial. Um, so in general, like non-trivial stuff in the bulk obstructs the existence of, of a stress tensor in this boundary vertex algebra. Also, in a way that I'll make more precise in a second, non-trivial stuff in the bulk 
contribute to a large center in the boundary algebra. And what I mean by center, it's the same language as saying that when OPs are non-singular, the algebra is commutative. Um, so the center of a vertex algebra is all operators that have regular OPEs with everything. Um, so one way to try to understand the center of the boundary algebra is, is by thinking about a bulk boundary map. Um, so physically, the bulk boundary map just says, take a bulk operator and bring it to the boundary. And that's a Q-exact operation. Uh, it's, it's a translation in the topological direction. Um, now, so naively, that's a map of vertex algebras from the bulk algebra to the boundary algebra. But it factors through the center, um, just because, well, it's, it's for, for the same sort of argument that we had before. Um, if a boundary operator comes from something in the bulk, then we can compute a, an OPE by, by pulling it back into the bulk, and then the OPE is non-singular. Um, so, so the image of the bulk boundary map lies in the center. Um, somewhat less trivially, um, one expects a surjection, uh, that, so, so that if there is ever any center in the boundary algebra, it, it comes from stuff in the bulk. Um, it's sort of like saying, I, 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 when I was writing this talk, I, had, I actually had, had trouble um, coming up with a very precise reason for this. Um, I think what I would say maybe more physically is if, if you cooked up a boundary algebra that had a center that wasn't coming from the bulk, you could actually just enhance the bulk for free um, and, and couple to a bigger bulk theory consistently um, such that this thing was uh, a surjection. Um, there, there's, there's some fancier, fancier reasons involving it's like line operators, why, why that should be true. But I think the, the cleanest physical explanation is that like, whenever you have a, a vertex algebra with a center, you, can, you must be able to couple it to, to some, some large enough bulk theory um, such that this is a surjection. Um, um, and there's another, there's another feature, which I'm, I'm not going to discuss in detail uh, that the, the, so the, the image of the bulk boundary map ends up in the center. Um, and the kernel of the bulk boundary map is preserved by the bulk brackets. And that's, that's a fun argument involving manipulating surfaces. Um, and so Jacques asked a question, uh, can't I just tensor the boundary algebra with some abelian factor? Um, what, so if you're thinking about like abelian 2D standard VOAs, those, those are not central. Um, it's like abelian current algebras or Heisenberg algebras or so on, like these, these all have interesting OPs. Um, uh, so, so I, I, I think and if like you can tensor it stupidly with something that's that's central but then i would say you, you should be able to use that to enhance the bulk at the same time um okay so now i'm going to go very quickly through sort of ex almost exactly at the halfway point um i'm going to go very quickly through some things that will probably make half the audience or maybe 95% of the audience fall asleep. Um, so um, there's, there are cool categorical and derived aspects of this bulk boundary map. Um, there's, so how, how to say it, um, in, in topological field theory, one learns and, and mathematically one just states um, that uh, given a generator of a category of boundary conditions, um, there's an isomorphism from the bulk algebra to the Hochschild 
cohomology of, of the boundary. Um, okay, so we can try to apply that sort of reasoning here. Um, the basic idea in defining a derived bulk boundary map physically is that instead of just bringing a bulk operator to the boundary, we can take a bulk, bulk operator, produce a descendant and integrate it around some surface surrounding boundary operators. Um, and this, is, this gives us new operations. Um, even if a bulk operator is zero when brought to the boundary, um, it's this higher operation where you take its descendant and integrate it on the hemisphere around the boundary operator might be non-zero. Um, and in that way, um, this derived map can still detect bulk operators that naively are zero when they're brought to the boundary. And it detects them by, by the higher operations or by the bracket. Um, and by taking um, analogous statements for topological field theories and trying to generalize them to this context, one ends up with a conjecture that when a boundary condition is sufficiently large or sufficiently rich, um, this derived bulk boundary map properly formulated uh, is, is an isomorphism. In other words, given a sufficiently rich boundary condition, one can fully reconstruct the bulk uh, by taking its so-called derived center. Um, uh, and this is, started to be verified in a few cases by, by Kevin's student, KU Zhang. Um, we'll say one other brief thing about this, sort of another perspective on how bulk and boundary algebras are related. Um, they're related through line operators. Um, so if we start thinking about line operators that wrap the topological direction, um, sort of the same way that in Chern-Simons theory, bulk lines give you modules for WCW. Um, same way here, bulk lines are going to give you modules for the boundary vertex algebra. Formally, there's a category of bulk lines and a functor from that category to modules for any boundary vertex algebra. Um, the trivial line or the empty line in the bulk just maps to the vacuum module. Um, and if you want to relate this to local operators, um, bulk local operators are self-interfaces of the trivial line. Um, and that's a computation of an X in the category of lines. Um, and then one can turn that X into a computation on the boundary. And so a way to rephrase the conjecture on the previous slide um, is that the bulk, given a sufficiently rich boundary condition, the bulk algebra should reappear as self x of the vacuum module. Um, and that's just a con concrete model for this thing that I called derived center in, in the previous slide. Um, so this computation of self x of the vacuum module has been done in, this, in the n equals four uh, boundary algebras by Castello, Kreutzig, and Gaiotto and beautifully reproduces like bulk monopole operators and all of this stuff. And it would be really cool to, to do this properly in, in n equals two theories. Okay, that's, that's as fancy and as deep as I will go into, into structure. Um, any, any questions on structural aspects of this part of this? No, I don't see any. Okay. Um, cool. So now I will slowly delve into the zoo of examples. What do these things look like? So if simplest 2D theory is just a free chiral multiplet. Um, and so in fact, Michaela has just typed in a question. He is asking, this is very similar to tilting. Am I off track? Oh, um, tilting in what sense? Yeah, you can just unmute yourself. Perhaps. Yeah. So it's easier. It looks like a, a tilting module. One. Oh. Uh, uh, it is. You wrote on the on the vacuum 
module. It's sorry. Uh, I th or it, that's a great comment, uh, and but I'm not sure that's true. Um, it was just a, a, a stupid question. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is there is likely some analog of tilting objects in these categories, but I I, hmm. I need, need, need to think whether it's related at all. Thanks. Um, I, I, I think, sorry, uh, pr probably not. So, uh, because I, I know analogs in 3D N equals four. Um, I, I, yeah, should just discuss that later. Um, okay, so, um, right, so free chiral in 3D, there are two, usually think of it as some superfield. There are two bits of that superfield that contribute to the bulk algebra, uh, the leading complex boson and one of the fermions. Um, they, if, if we think about a U1 symmetry rotating that chiral, uh, the boson and the fermion have opposite charges. So like the fermion I'm talking about is one of those sidebars. Um, and so the bulk algebra is just modes of, of a boson and a fermion. Um, the, the OP is, of course, trivial, um, but the bracket is not. And so the, the bracket um, sort of pairs the, the boson and the fermion. Um, and if you write down the supercurrent, uh, you find very nicely that the bracket with the supercurrent generates derivatives. Uh, and by del here, I mean del, del z, the, the holomorphic derivative. Um, there are two basic boundary conditions for, for the chiral. Uh, either you kill the fermion, and it's more naturally called Neumann, or you kill the boson, it's more naturally called Dirichlet. It's like two brain or zero brain. Um, and what's left on the boundary is, is the other half. Um, sorry, so I did not approach properly write down the other half. It's unfortunately going to propagate to the next slide or two. Okay. So if you if you kill the fermion, you're left with the modes of the boson. And if you kill the boson, you're left with the modes of the fermion. Um, the boundary algebras in this case are central just because everything is coming from the bulk. There's there's no boundary OPE. Um, and yeah, sorry. Sorry, that again, just need to be swapped. Um, and if you go through this whole derived analysis that I was explaining, it's actually quite easy. Like I, I, I understand it's unfamiliar, but it's mathematically easy to compute the derived center or to look at the category of line operators, which is also nice. In this case, it's coherent sheaves on the Laurent series. Um, at, and compute everything and reconstruct the bulk algebra from the boundary. Um, Next, next simplest case, lando ginzburg models. Let's let's add a bulk superpotential. So, so Kevin discussed this um, and during his string math talk of it. Um, so, um, if we introduce a bulk superpotential, um, the bulk algebra gets deformed by it. Um, so, initially, it's still generated by. Um, by bosonic and by pairs of bosonic and fermionic fields. Uh, but now there's a non-trivial differential on top of that uh, that says that Q of a fermion is the corresponding derivative of the superpotential. This should be familiar as a standard supersymmetry transformation in 3D n equals two or like an F term equation. Um, mathematically, uh, this is, this is sort of familiar object, uh, the, the, the loop space or the infinite jet scheme of the derived critical locus of the superpotential. And, and then we can throw in boundary conditions. Um, and now something cool can happen. Um, by using appropriate boundary conditions, we can make it so that there are 
sort of effectively boundary operators that are sort of massless on the boundary, but massive in the bulk. Um, is effectively what's going on. Um, what's actually going on is that we can make it so they're, they're boundary operators that are Q closed, even though they are not Q closed in the bulk. Um, let me just first, let me go through the formulas. Um, so um, the simplest boundary conditions one can choose for Lando Ginsburg model um, involve choosing a linear subspace of these chirals on which the superpotential vanishes. I call that, that subspace L. Um, and then the boundary algebra is generated by the bosons along L and the fermions that are normal to L, sort of the complementary subset of the fermions, um, with the standard action of Q, but restricted to L, and now a boundary OPE. Um, and I think the boundary OPE will make a little more sense in examples, why it can be non-trivial. Um, in computations, the, this is a standard one loop Feynman diagram that gives rise to this. Um, so the OPE of two boundary fermions uh, is one over Z times the second derivative of that superpotential. So let me let me do the canonical example. If we consider the XYZ model, so that's three chiral superfields in the bulk, X and Y and Z. Um, the bulk algebra has three bosons and the corresponding fermionic superpartners. Um, and Q of fermion X is boson YZ and, and so on. Um, if we want, want a boundary condition on which the superpotential vanishes, the one simple thing we can do is just set Y and Z to zero. Um, so, uh, so then our boundary algebra is generated by the bosonic part of X and the fermions corresponding to Y and Z. Um, that's bosons along our subspace and fermions normal to it. Um, and now we discover that even though Q acted non-trivially on all of the bulk fermions, uh, and so none of the bulk fermions were actually part of the bulk algebra because they're not Q closed. Uh, once we're on the boundary, because of our boundary condition, um, Q just acts as zero on everything. Um, and so the boundary algebra is just generated by this boson and two fermions. Um, and now these fermions, which are not coming from something Q closed in the bulk can have a non-trivial OP. Um, and it's computed by taking two derivatives of the superpotential and we get that the, the two fermions have an OP that's one over Z times the boson. Um, which is very simple, but also Kind of, kind of cool for something that simple. Um, and then uh, just as a note, um, so there, there are much more interesting boundary conditions in the lando ginsburg model, uh, models that involve adding extra boundary matter. Um, so if you want to choose a subspace on which the superpotential doesn't vanish, then you have to add boundary fermions with E and J terms that factor the superpotential. Um, and here in, on this slide, I'm sort of describing an extreme case of this where I've chosen for my subspace all of the chirals, so nothing, it's Neumann on everything, and then you need to add boundary fermions, uh, and, and the analysis is of, of what this does uh, to the boundary algebra is fairly straightforward. The, the upshot is that the only non-singular OPEs are coming from these extra boundary fermions. Um, maybe the one thing I'll say here, uh, just as a reminder, um, so two-dimensional fermions come in a complex conjugate pair. This is maybe to be contrasted with 
what the boundary algebra corresponding to a bulk fermion. So when we have a bulk chiral and we use a Dirichlet boundary condition, we just we sort of get half of a 2D fermion. We don't get gamma and gamma tilde or fermion and fermion conjugate, we just get half of it, which is why the OPEs can be non-singular. Um, anyway, so so um, in this matrix factorization case, um, we introduce extra fermions and get a corresponding algebra that we discuss in great detail in the paper and look at some dualities involving it. Okay. Um, so, um, awesome. I think in the last part of this, um, I want to start saying some things about gauge theories. Oh, I missed that. Stefano Cremonesi. You haven't discussed bulk real masses. Is it because real mass terms are too exact? No, um, it's not. Uh, it's so so in this in this twist. Um, in a um, real masses, or in a gauge theory, the real scalars and the vector multiplet. Um, combine with the gauge field to complexify uh, the gauge group uh, or the connection. Um, and so in these analyses of vertex algebras, and in fact, the gauge groups that are relevant are complexified ones and connections that are relevant are complexified ones. Um, so if there's a flavor symmetry and you want to include real masses, what will happen is that uh, various derivatives will become covariant. Um, and they're, they're like covariant in a complexified sense. So the mass just, just contributes, just adds into the derivative. Um, and and, there's, and there's, there's sort of just a very systematic way to, to throw that in. Um, Um, okay, so, um, so gauge theories. Um, the part about gauge theory, gauge theories in three dimensions is monopole operators. Um, as, as I said, there's various work uh, in, in progress now to try to actually understand the full bulk algebra, including monopole operators. Uh, maybe at this point, I'll take a second to remind everyone uh, that in terms of characters, everything is totally under control. And I, I haven't emphasized that very much because the, the point of this is constructing the algebras, but the characters of the bulk algebras are called 3D indices. Um, they've been very, very well studied. Um, and the characters of the boundary algebras are 3D half indices. They have also now been well studied. Um, and, and 3D indices involve monopole sums in general. And, and so it's, like, it's clear that monopole operators will contribute. Um, the question is how you deal with them in a vertex algebra um, and in particular on boundaries, how you think about their OPEs. Um, even in the bulk, um, the, the OPEs are regular, but, there's, but you still want to know what happens when you say collide two monopole operators of opposite charges, what do you get? Um, so there are various methods that might solve that question, including some generalizations of the BFN approach to, to 3D n equals four monopole operators. Um, there are a few cases in which boundary algebras are more tractable than bulk algebras. Um, the nicest case by far is the boundary algebra for a Neumann boundary condition. Um, and it's nice because Neumann boundary conditions kill all the monopole operators. Um, and so you don't have to go through a non-perturbative analysis. Um, so 
So let me describe what happens for for Neumann boundary conditions. Again, Kevin had had said a bit about this in string math. Um, so the only subtlety with Neumann boundary conditions on the gauge fields is that there are two dimensional gauge anomalies to be canceled. Um, and there's a systematic computation of these boundary anomalies. Um, the rule of thumb is that you take the bulk and Simons level and add, add to it half of what you would have gotten in a two dimensional anomaly calculation. Um, and you cancel anomalies with extra boundary matter. So example, um, if you take SQED, so U1 at level zero with two chirals of charges one and minus one and put Neumann boundary conditions on everything. So Neumann for the gauge field, so gauge symmetry is preserved um, at the boundary and, and the bosons in phi and phi tilde are preserved. Um, these bosons contribute a boundary anomaly in some convention of in some units minus one, and it has to be canceled with a boundary Fermi multiplet. Um, so in order to make this boundary condition self-consistent, one has to add stuff. Um, in this case, minimally a boundary Fermi multiplet. Um, okay, so once we do that, um, the boundary algebra is obtained as follows. Um, you can start with sort of the ungauged theory. Just take the bulk matter, possibly with the superpotential, coupled to boundary stuff, and put together some big vertex algebra corresponding to all of that. That big vertex algebra has an action of the loop group. And I want to really emphasize, as Kevin did, that this is not an internal Katsumudi action. Um, there is not necessarily a Katsumudi inside this boundary algebra that's generating the loop group action through OPEs because this action is really coming from a bulk gauge symmetry. It's sort of for the same reason that there aren't always boundary stress tensors because you need to integrate stuff in the bulk. Um, so then roughly we need to take invariants under this loop group action. Um, and the proper way to do that is to add ghosts. Um, so we'll add a C ghost and we'll implement a BRST transformation where Q acting on any operator is an infinite, infinitesimal gauge transformation with parameter C. Um, so that is sort of the zeroth order prescription. Um, And it has a modification um, in that both physically and mathematically, one should not really be introducing ghosts for constant gauge transformations um, and rather invariance under sort of global constant gauge transformations should be imposed by hand. And that amounts to only including derivatives of the C ghost and just taking invariance by hand with respect to constant gauge transformations. Um, so um, one ends up with, with a description like this that you know, hope, hopefully doesn't look too horrible, uh, is totally systematic. Um, and two notes to make, this, this C ghost um, is physically the same, it's, it's cohomologous to the bulk gauge genome or to one of the bulk gauge genomes. Um, and so what you, another way to think about this is that a Neumann boundary condition on the gauge multiplet, um, again, preserves half the fields and what it's preserving is some fermions. And, and these, these are just showing up as the sea ghosts. Um, the other sort of useful conceptual thing to remember uh, is that in this calculation, it doesn't look like the bulk turn Simon's level shows up anywhere. Um, it's certainly not going to show up in V ungaged. That's just matter. Um, the only place where it actually enters is an anomaly cancellation. Um, and once you've satisfied the anomaly condition, then ev everything else goes through and, and, and it doesn't enter. Um, maybe another way to say that is the anomaly cancellation condition is really important. Uh, and and is, is actually giving you a lot of information. 
Okay. Um, so that, that's the general prescription. Let me actually give you an example of how it's implemented. And I, I, I have five minutes left, right? Is that, okay, good. Um, okay, so if we try to run, run this with, with SQED, um, as I said before, we need an extra boundary Fermi multiplet. Um, and so the boundary algebra, sorry, too much information on the slide. Uh, so the boundary algebra starts out as life before gauging um, as being generated by two bosons, phi and phi tilde of gauge charge one and minus one, and this extra boundary stuff. There's a boundary fermion, gamma gamma tilde of gauge charge plus and minus one, and the boundary fermion has a singular OPE. And now to take gauge invariance under the loop group, we'll introduce derivatives of the C ghost um, and restrict by hand to operators that are invariant under global U1 rotations. Um, and so that, that means we form words in operators where all of the U1 charges cancel. Um, so we can form phi phi tilde, uh, that's one and minus one cancels, and we can form phi gamma tilde and phi tilde gamma and gamma gamma tilde, and all the ghosts are also neutral. And then take a homology. Um, and I don't know, na naively it might be, d depending on your perspective, um, it might be surprising that Q does anything to, to these operators. And in the, the case of the first three, it doesn't do anything. Um, but the gamma, gamma tilde product has to be normal ordered and the normal ordering in, induces um, a sort of a, a, non, a, a transformation under non-constant, um, it has a non-constant gauge transformation. Um, and so, Beautiful thing uh, that happens uh, is that in cohomology, this gamma gamma tilde operator cancels with the derivative of the C ghost. Um, and one can, with a lot more work um, and use of the index formulas, prove uh, that Q cohomology of, of this entire thing uh, just reduces to a very simple algebra with three generators, uh, one, one boson, phi phi tilde, and two fermions, phi gamma tilde and phi tilde gamma. Um, the differential is now zero, and there's a singular OPE. Um, and that might be familiar, maybe, uh, from the description of XYZ. Uh, and so th this is dual to that boundary condition I described earlier for, for X, Y, Z. Um, and so this, this is a classic duality um, of 3D n equals two theories discussed by Aharoni, Hanani, interligator, interligator Cyborg, and Strathler. Um, it can be promoted to a duality of boundary conditions. And um, so on the boundary of phi phi tilde is X, Phi gamma tilde is psi y and gamma tilde, or phi tilde gamma is psi z. So two fermions have an OPE that involves the boson. Um, um, right, so let's, ooh, I have two minutes, awesome. Um, maybe one thing to point out in all of the examples that have appeared so far, the boundary algebra has had a fairly large center. Here, the center of the boundary algebra is this is generated by this phi phi tilde or x. The boson has trivial OPE with everything and it's coming from the bulk. Um, in the last example I'll give you, um, the center will be trivial. So this has to do with Dirichlet boundary conditions and gauge theory. So in general, these are hard Dirichlet boundary conditions again, have boundary monopole operators. Um, and so one needs some way to deal with them. Um, and the example I want to give you is sort of the simplest one of the Dirichlet boundary condition, uh, where in the bulk, we start with Yang-Nose-Trin-Simons theory. 
Um, so if we start with yang most and Simons for group G at level K, uh, assuming K is sufficiently positive, uh, one knows physically that this flows to a level K minus dual Coxeter number, pure Trent Simons theory, and the bulk, which is topological, which means that the bulk operator algebra is going to be trivial. Uh, and in this case, in particular for Trent Simons, um, in cohomology, the, the bulk algebra is just, gen is just generated by the identity, um, which means by the bulk boundary map that anything we have on the boundary will have no center, and now there's a chance of having a stress tensor. Um, now we sort of know what boundary condition we should find for pure Trent Simons theory. We should be getting WZW, uh, but it's kind of interesting to see how that comes about. In Yang Mills Trent Simons theory, it is consistent to impose a standard Dirichlet boundary condition, which just means kill the components of the connection parallel to the boundary. Notice this is not the sort of like holomorphic boundary condition that one imposes in pure Trent Simons. Um, this is a UV boundary condition where there's a Yang-Mills term as well. So now that makes sense. Um, and then there's a perturbative computation that involves some Feynman diagrams um, that tells you the boundary algebra is generated by a particular component of the curvature, which happens to be Q closed. Um, and one finds that OPEs, um, I called it B because it's convenient to write this as a BF theory. Um, OPEs among this component of the curvature um, look like look like Katsumudi. Um, they look like Katsumudi at level K minus dual Coxeter number. Um, so that that's a reassuring perturbative computation. The hard part, of course, was supposed to be the monopole operators um, that have to enhance this from Katsumudi to WZW. Um, and a, there is a direct calculation of that uh, that involves a state operator correspondence and something BFN-like. Um, so if we compute Q cohomology of the Hilbert space on sort of a little raised disk that, that surrounds a boundary operator, uh, we find del Boko homology of the affine Grassmannian for G um, valued in a particular line bundle that depends on the Trent Simons level. Um, and this affine Grassmannian is the same one that was showing up in BFN, except there it was sort of a Duram-like cohomology and here it's del Bo. Um, that's, that's topological versus holomorphic twist. Um, and it's actually known um, among, among experts in, in mathematics, um, that Dalbo cohomology of the affine Grassmannian, which is a hat because it's been dualized, um, is uh, is the WZW um, vertex algebra, um, and and so so here there's beautifully a direct calculation that produces this, um, and in in our paper we also described how to in principle enhance this calculation when there's matter around. And so if we have a bulk theory with matter and a Dirichlet boundary condition, um, then one takes a sort of a similar Dalbo homology of Dalboko homology of the affine Grassmannian with a very fancy matter bundle on top. Um, and that, that reproduces the right index or the right half index, which which means one gets a vector space, sort of the right charges, but computing an OPE from that is, is very far from, from obvious. Uh, even here, like it's known mathematically that you get the WZW VOA from uh, cohomology of the Afghan uh, Gaussmannian, but like, making sure the OPE is correct is, is highly non-trivial. Um, okay, and that, sorry, I went over time and that's, that's all I wanna say, thank you. Thank you very much. It was a very nice talk. Let's all clap. I can do sort of the string massing and unmute everyone. I think that's scary. Let's not do that. Let's just clap. Right? <laughs> Are there questions? You can raise your hand or just type it into the chat.
Uh, so there's a question by Ali by Ali Schaefer. Uh, Please hi, unmute yourself. Yes. Hi. Um, so is the condition for the boundary algebra to have a stress tensor precisely that uh, it does not have any center? Um, that's a necessary condition. Um, it's not. It's not sufficient. Um, what what's the sufficient condition? Um, I I am not. I, I don't know one. Um, um, I just it, let me also just point out that the analysis of the existence of the stress tensor was really hard, even for twists of zero comma two models, where like it's it's clear that there was no center. But um, so this this was. Maybe Silverstein and Witten. Um, I, I ho hope I'm not not mis misquoting that. Um, but uh, so so physically, there's a stress tensor there for sure. Uh, but then the question is whether it's Q closed and and thus an element of of your algebra. I see. Um, um. So in, in the very beginning, you mentioned that uh, for um, um, for for some three D n equals two theory that come from three D three D correspondence, uh, it is the case that the boundary algebra is a log B OA. I I did not say that, but I I think there are now many examples in. In, in work of, of Sergey and collaborators, um, and, and, and it's in particular in that in that work of modularity with Cheng Chen and, and Ferrari and Harrison. Um, so yeah, so there, there's a stress tensor, and I, I find this um, I find this mysterious. Um, I, I think there has to be something very special about the bulk about the bulk theory in this case, that it's either topological or very close to topological um, in order to allow the existence of, of the boundary stress tensor. Um, if, um, again, like in, in, in any of these gauge theory examples, if, if there's anything non-trivial in the bulk, the boundary will have a center. Right. Um, right. Yeah, uh, or possibly there's like, maybe like the, the bulk could be compact or for, for, for some, like th there, there, may be, there may be other ways to, to make sure that there's no center on the boundary, but that, that, that it is, does seem to be what's happening there. And, and I'm not sure how general a feature it is of, of, of three manifold theories. I, I see. And do you do you expect you expect that it has um, some origin in in the compactification on three manifolds from from sixteen? I mean, I mean, I sort of expect that it's it's related to compactifying on like ciphered manifolds or things with the positive curvature, um, as as opposed to hyperbolic manifolds. But I I think it this needs to be investigated. I see. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? I don't see any other questions. I think we can continue with more informal questions, but let's thank our tutor yeah. again first, and then we could stop the recording.